Welcome everybody. We are glad you're joining us today. Um, our module for today is addressing equity in tobacco dependence treatment. And um, we are rounding out the course and I think this is a really important topic to end with. We're grateful this quarter that we are bringing a number of excellent speakers to you. And part of the reason for that is our partnership with the Northwest Addiction Technology Transfer Center Network or ATTC. And um, the ATTC is at the University of Washington as well. And so they are a natural partner um, for us to be working with. They're in the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Institute. Um, next slide. Their main goal um, is really to train the future and current addiction workforce. And um, they do that in a number of different ways. They sponsor trainings online and in person. They provide intensive technical assistance to support systems change and organizational efforts around adoption of evidence-based practices. They offer consulting. They disseminate science-based information. And they're serving um, current and future uh, treatment workforce members in Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. So we're grateful to them for their partnership and for um, being able to bring speakers like Dr. McAfee to you today. Um, so I want to introduce Dr. Tim McAfee, who is our speaker for today. Oh, I forgot to mention that there will be a survey coming to you um, after this uh, module has wrapped up, and it is not mandatory for you to take. It will only take one minute or less for you to complete, but it's really important and valuable information to help the Northwest ATTC continue to bring good programs to you. So we would highly encourage you to take that survey. Um, so without further ado, I'm um, privileged and honored to be able to introduce Dr. Tim McAfee to you today. Um, Dr. McAfee is the former director and senior medical officer at the Office on Smoking and Health at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, while he has um, stepped down from his director post, he is still currently a consultant with the Office on Smoking and Health at CDC working on media and web development work. Um, he is also the former chief medical officer and founder of a company called Free and Clear that is now part of Optum and um, was, has been the largest provider of phone and web-based uh, help to smokers. So he has a lot of expertise in the, the area of treatment. He is a primary care physician and the former director of the Center for Health Promotion at Group Health, which is now Kaiser. And he's also part of our University of Washington community as an affiliate faculty member. Um, on a personal note, Dr. McAfee and I have worked together for a couple decades, and I have learned most of what I know about this topic from him. So um, it's really an honor to, to be able to hear from him. I learn something every time I hear him speak. So I'm looking forward to hearing you talk with us today, Dr. McAfee, take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jillian. And the uh, feeling is mutual uh, around all that I've learned from you over the last uh, 15 or 20 years. And um, I am thrilled to be having the opportunity to talk to all of you. I'm sorry it has to be asynchronous but um, I'm uh, enjoying the, the possibility of sharing with you the incredibly important set of issues that are associated with uh, existing health equity and disparity is issues that are associated with the um, delivery of tobacco dependence uh, treatment uh, predominantly in the United States. And I will be talking about this at some Detail before I do it, I wanted to do a short disclosure. Um, although the reality is, I don't technically have to do any disclosure. I thought it would be interesting just to think about it. So here's what I'm disclosing. First of all, I confess that over the last decade, I have worked directly or indirectly for the federal government. Now, that may not seem like so. What's the conflict there? Well, I just want, uh, I try to keep in my own mind aware of the fact that the federal government each year raises between 13 and $15 billion in tobacco tax revenue. Uh, and that this really uh, uh, objectively is a financial conflict of interest that, that the federal government has and state governments that tax tobacco products as well do, because if they were to put in place policies that completely eradicated rapidly uh, that the, the purchase of tobacco products, they would lose, in the federal government's case, uh, almost $15 billion in tax revenue, which is almost real money. I have no uh, relationships with the pharmaceutical industry. As Jillian indicated, I did have a relationship with one of the counseling industries, um, uh, Quitlines, 
um, but I have not had any for the past 10 years. The most important to me is, is to acknowledge, I'm actually proud uh, of the fact that I have friends, family and colleagues and patients that were killed by smoking. When I say I'm proud, I mean, uh, I mean as I'm gonna indicate, I'm proud of how uh, some of them handled this horrible affliction that was put upon them. But that has affected my own um, way I think about this because of these, these ongoing exposures to the suffering that's caused by tobacco use and by the predatory practices of the tobacco industry. In the left um, um, bottom of the slide is my uh, friend and colleague, Terry Hall, who worked on the CDC's TIPS campaign. And I had the honor to know her and work very, very closely with her for several years and uh, was actually present uh, just the day before she died in a North Carolina hospital from her tobacco inflicted uh, disease. So this has affected me and you'll have to decide whether, um, I think there are very few of us that are not affected uh, by something like this, but how we, how we process it is important uh, for our work and can be mobilized uh, in a positive fashion. Now what I'm gonna cover is basically four big buckets today. First, because um, I'm talking about tobacco treatment, I think it's important to talk about what, what I mean and what is generally meant by treatment. I'm going to come at this from two different overlapping perspectives. One of them is actually wearing my public health hat. Uh, and as a trained epidemiologist, how do I think about the delivery of treatment? Uh, and how do I think about it as a public health person in terms of impact, uh, the impact that treatment can have on, on population levels of smoking. But I'm also going to talk about it as a clinician and in the more classic way that we think about treatment, about drugs and medicines and you know how we get them to people and all that kind of stuff. And then number three, I'm, or excuse me, number two, I'm going to talk about health inequity issues that are facing smokers. And I'm taking, this is a somewhat unusual perspective on health inequity. Uh, because we usually think about health inequities and disparities about sort of the classic subpopulations, race, race, ethnicity, uh, sex, sexual orientation, uh, socioeconomic status, uh, et cetera. And I am going to talk about that. So that's the third area that I'm going to talk about. But I also, from my decades of experience, have come to believe that there are a set of health inequity issues that face smokers that really cut across those uh, different disparate groups and that smokers um, really almost irregardless of the other, their other characteristics as human beings face a unique set of, uh, of issues. And finally, I'm gonna speak about um, potential solutions, which is uh, both fun and frustrating to talk about as you'll see. But before we got into that, I thought I would just take a minute since we've, we've had unfolding in the United States during uh, 220 and 221, the a, a uh, remarkably horrific but educational uh, experience with how our society has dealt with the COVID-19 and is dealing with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And as somebody who's thought about a pan another pandemic that's been more invisible, uh, the pandemic of deaths caused by particularly cigarettes and other tobacco products, I, I thought it, it would, might be useful to think for just a minute about what these things have in common and what's different about them. Uh, so first, they both have the potential to kill hundreds of thousands of Americans a year if, if not, not addressed. <clears throat> there have also been very powerful and ongoing efforts to try to deny and minimize the health impact of both pandemics. And a lot of this has been related to, um, in the case of you know, cigarettes, it's because the tobacco industry stands to gain by their ongoing sale. Um, and in the sense of COVID, it has to do with the sense of the potential that, that uh, of the economic disruption that's caused by the measures to halt its spread. Um, so both parties, uh, people that are worried about the economy in the US and specifically the tobacco industry have made very powerful and ongoing uh, arguments that doing significant things that we know would work would uh, devastate the, the economy. Uh, the other thing that they have in common is that both of them, for both of them, they have prevention and treatments that exist that decrease their rate of infection or initiation in the case of tobacco use 
and mortality from, from the use. Um, another thing that is fascinating and not automatic is that the death rates uh, for both pandemics have correlated with age in a similar pattern with death rates uh, becoming progressively worse as people age and also are correlated with uh, a similar set of chronic conditions like uh, lung disease and heart disease and diabetes uh, and obesity, all of which are made worse for tobacco uh, if, you have, if you smoke and all of which are made uh, obviously much worse if you have COVID and COVID is made worse. The last thing that they both have in common is that health equity issues abound for both of them. And they, and they have follow similar patterns. They uh, are uh, affecting uh, people that have been uh, impacted by systemic racism in our country uh, have been uh, much more uh, affected and impacted by COVID-19 as they have been with tobacco, uh, socioeconomic status. The mechanisms are not exactly the same, but they are, but they are both impacting in negative ways uh, both, uh, both pandemics. Now, there are also some important conditions. Uh, one of them is that the research and development for the prevention and treatment has been, there, there's, it's hard to imagine a faster track than what's happened uh, around COVID-19 with treatments that were del delivered in, or were developed in weeks or months and preventive efforts both around public health interventions, but also vaccine happening within a few months to a year. This is the, the polar opposite of what has happened in tobacco. 50 years ago, this little book was put out 55 years ago in 1964, first Surgeon General's report linking smoking and um, health, uh, lung cancer, COPD, and death. Uh, it was 30 years from when this book was published before the first medication to help people quit smoking came out. Um, and it was 55 years before this book came out in early 2020, which was the first Surgeon General report that systematically looked at smoking cessation interventions. So talk about a slow boat, talk about a fast boat. The other thing that's different is that cigarettes are manufactured and promoted by humans. And these two bullets are related. In other words, I firmly believe that the reason it's taken us 50 years, 55 years uh, to get to where we are around uh, treating treatments for smoking is because of the uh, very uh, pervasive, subtle, uh, ongoing influence of the tobacco industry. Uh, cigarettes are manufactured by an industry. There's nothing like that with COVID. There are economic issues, et cetera, but nothing like what the tobacco industry. And in terms of what we've seen, uh, in terms of the role that the mass media has played and not played, uh, for COVID, we've seen for months uh, daily tallies that, that indicate both initiation of COVID, i.e. the number of cases, and the number of smoking deaths every day in uh, newspapers, magazines, online. There's, there's never been anything like this with tobacco, despite the fact that more people died per day of, of tobacco use every day so far during the COVID um, uh, 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 pandemic, then there's still more people that die from tobacco use, but it's all hidden and invisible, uh, quietly tucked away uh, for most most of our life. Uh, there, there's there's also incredible differentiations between how much we as a society have been willing to pay for COVID treatment, with ten to twenty thousand uh, dollars uh, being paid for hospitalizations for COVID. And and I'm not arguing that any of this shouldn't happen with COVID. It obviously needs to. The thing that's absolutely amazing is to sit sit back and think. Why aren't we acting like this around tobacco? What's keeping us as a society from treating treatment for, for uh, cigarette use and tobacco the way we have for COVID? Um, and lastly, the other difference around COVID is it's going to be mostly wrapped up. Uh, you know, it's going to be a it's going to be a pandemic that lasted for you know one to two years with tail off, whereas tobacco use cigarettes were really became aggressively mass produced in the teens of the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so it's been over 100 years and it's been over 50 years since we firmly established that they caused a uh, huge death and disease in our population. Okay, so 
Uh, now I'm going to talk about what is involved in tobacco treatment and, and what it means. And I'm starting from the perspective of an epidemiologist in public health. So let's think about it from the total population perspective. If you look at this slide, the white area is non-tobacco users. And the first large circle is all tobacco, all tobacco users. Uh, for smokers, that's around 15% uh, of the uh, US population, but there, there are certain populations where it gets as high as 35%, uh, those with substance abuse, American Indians, and there's some where it gets much smaller than 15%. But uh, within it, within all tobacco users, there's a smaller circle, which is people that are making attempts to quit. And about half, of, a little more than half of uh, smokers try to quit in a year. It's obviously less than that any uh, week or month. Uh, but a significant fraction are trying to make attempts to quit, and that's malleable, whether somebody makes a, a quit or not. The, these membranes between each of these circles are permeable, and we can influence them through policies and practices and communication. And then within those who are attempting to quit, there's a smaller circle uh, of those who are using some evidence-based support during their quit attempt. It's about one third of people use any form of, of evidence-based support. Everybody else is just sort of like trying to figure out how to do it on their own. And within that circle, there's an even smaller circle, which is people that are using highly effective evidence-based support. And that's a very small circle, um, meaning people that use it uh, a medication and use counseling and use it for the full uh, course of treatment, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the other way to think about this is, okay, so what? what what's the implication of this? The implication is how do we increase the total long-term quits in a population? And in order to do that, to go back to this, we have to move people from the all tobacco user circle into the attempting to quit circle and then ideally we want them to use some evidence with support and we want them to use highly effective ones. But from a policy perspective, um, a lot, mostly a lot of our interventions only focus on one of these, like increasing quit attempts. Historically, uh, th this was done in mass media campaigns would only focus on increasing quit attempts in the population. That's, that's all they did up until 10 or 20 years ago. Increasing use of evidence-based support, something that often would happen in, in clinical environments, as would increasing the effectiveness of evidence-based support. But each of these, there were sort of wheels that could be moved to make these things happen, both in the larger societal uh, arena, but also even within the clinical environment, there are different things that could be done that would affect each of these three things. Um, however, there is a sweet spot in the center where all three, that there's certain interventions that can do all three of these things. For instance, clinical interventions that take a, a, a more global perspective can do everything from having clinicians encourage people to quit, to helping them to, to get a quit plan, to following them up and making sure they get more intensive uh, use of materials. And this slide just gives a little more examples of this. So to increase quit attempts, um, you can have comprehensive clinic system interventions that have doctors give very brief advice. The brief advice basically just helps people make quit attempts. Um, but you can also, the reason it's got some asterisks by it is because the clinic system interventions have the capacity, as I mentioned, to do any of these other things as well. We have mass media campaigns that historically only increase quit attempts, but we're increasingly seeing mass media campaigns that are doing more, and I'll talk about that in some detail. Um, now, for increasing the use of evidence-based support, there are big policy and programmatic things that can be done to encourage people to avail themselves of this. That bottom line, they require the promotion and removal of access barriers uh, to, to getting support. And they, they, they benefit from changes that can happen to make the, the products and services more patient-friendly. Uh, just to give one example, uh, the nicotine gum was actually designed to not be very tasty and not be very much fun to chew. This was due to concerns about uh, addiction. This has been evolving over the past 10 or 15 years and, and other uh, methods have been used to try to develop products that actually you know, are not sort of as uncomfortable for people to use. Um, there's also the possibility of increasing the uh, effectiveness if somebody is using 
uh, uh, support. And just a couple of the big items around this is first to combine modalities. You put counseling and medication use, you put them together and they synergize and work better than they do if, if you only use one of them or they don't work together. You can also ha actually add, take one medicine and add it to another medication. I'll talk a little more about that. And for all of these, the reality is increasing the dose, increasing the duration, increasing the amount of instruction and support that people get for the use of these medic medications or counseling, all will increase their effectiveness. So now I'm just gonna drill down a little bit more uh, for those, particularly for those of you who have a clinical background or have clinical aspirations. I'm gonna take a few minutes to talk more so you're familiar with what the landscape actually looks like in tobacco treatment. So which ones, what clinical interventions uh, help uh, people who wanna quit, quit. Um, brief advice to quit from a healthcare professional. Uh, if this is institutionalized in a clinic setting, uh, it has even this, just as if clinicians put, spend 30 seconds with every single person who's identified as uh, being a tobacco user, if that's all they do, they will increase quit attempts. And when people make more quit attempts, more people quit. Um, now, but more can be done around counseling. I'm going to talk more about this uh, in an upcoming slide. And the FDA approved medications and systems and policy supports, and I'm going to do a little slide on each of these. So for clinician interventions, the good news is a lot of clinicians and, and healthcare administrators and, and clinic managers are very nervous about institutionalizing this because they think it's going to make people not like them, switch to a different clinic, switch to a different provider. It turns out if this is done well and systematically, as long as there's empathy, uh, patients end up preferring this type of service because you know most of them want to quit and um, most of them would realize that they're going to get in trouble with their tobacco use if, it, if they don't do something about it so they appreciate that their providers bringing this up um, the rest of these are all obvious so even brief interventions increase the odds that a patient will try to quit and that they will be successful now what about counseling counseling has a number of different components um, and these range from simply trying to increase the motivation that somebody has to, to quit and reinforcing that to providing actual support to them in them to, to letting them know that there's help available to them and that and that we care we care about the person and then there's a set of fairly straightforward practical advice that can be given given to uh, tobacco users interested in quitting for, which ranges from uh, you really should get rid of all those cigarettes and ashtrays and stuff out of your house, out of your car, and don't keep cigarettes around because that'll just tempt you and make you more likely to, to relapse to things about uh, how to handle their friends who smoke, uh, situations like, you know, if they usually go to, go to a, a bar with friends who smoke, you know, how to, how to handle these things. This is all practical advice. There are also things that are more sophisticated out of the come at more out of psychology like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, acceptance commitment therapy that clinicians don't really need to know how to do those that are really interested can get training and some of these things can be done in just with a couple minutes intervention all of these things can be delivered and this has been proven that they can be delivered in, in multiple settings inside healthcare and outside healthcare one-on-one -on -one clinician interventions by physicians by nurses by pharmacists uh, are effective individual or group counseling sessions in person, but also uh, done through uh, telephonically via quit line, via websites, via um, apps and texting programs. And again, the bottom line is that more, the more the smokers get and the more repetition there is, uh, the more likely they are to quit. I'm just gonna talk briefly about one specific one because I'm gonna bring this up uh, later which is uh, Quit Lines, which is an innovation that was developed in the 1980s and 1990s and really was disseminated successfully uh, throughout the country during the uh, first decade of the 21st century. And this is, so this was developed over a 10 year period. So it's evidence-based, it's been studied with very large clinical trials and involves giving tailored services to, smoke, to smokers around, first was developed uh, counseling techniques where people would get one to five brief counseling sessions over the telephone using the techniques that I just told you about counseling. And then NRT, which stands for nicotine replacement therapy, sometimes quit lines have, have also integrated 
the, the provision of nicotine replacement, uh, often fulfilled through uh, the mail. These are free, almost always free and confidential. They're delivered in, the, in multiple languages. Uh, and they have been shown to markedly increase the ease of access, particularly of target populations, such as those that are uninsured and those that are on Medicaid or Medicare. And in some uh, states, and Washington State actually does this, a clinician can actually refer somebody directly to the, um, to the quit line and the quit line will call them proactively. Now let's talk about medications for a minute. Again, it's sort of sad that it took 30 years from the time that that um, first Surgeon General came out before the pharmaceutical industry developed medications, uh, but we have medications now that have been clearly shown to work. Um, now we have seven, but five of them are essentially variants on how nicotine is delivered, the patch, the gum, the inhaler, the spray, and the lozenge. And, they, um, and then we have bupropion, which is a, a um, reconfigured antidepressant. I mean, it's really just exactly the same medicine, bupropion, that's delivered, uh, uh, that was just uh, discovered to also work to help people quit smoking. And then another medication, varenicline, which is a, a slightly reconfigured uh, uh, pharmaceutical molecule that, that it was the active ingredient inside a, an, an herbal remedy that was effectively used in Eastern Europe was reconfigured um, and then patented by the uh, by a pharmaceutical company and has turned out to be uh, clearly the most effective single uh, medication with, with higher odds ratios, uh, threefold increase in your probability of quitting compared to 1.5 to 2 for the other single medications. And then the other one is, the other innovation that's happened is the, the, the idea of using two medications at once. Isn't that sort of sad? Isn't that sad that it took 40 years before we thought it was okay to use these incredibly cheap compared to you know, medications? It took us 40 years before we figured out that you could put, use two medications at the same time, that it was safer and more effective. I mean, you think of what the medications that get given to people for chemotherapy, uh, for, for COVID, uh, which it took us, what, three months to figure out, you know, cocktails that, that worked. And it's taken us 40 or 50 years to figure out how to do this for, uh, for people who want to quit smoking. Now, the other thing that has been shown to work um, over the last couple of decades is system change, where we um, integrate tackle dependence treatment into the clinical workflow. So it's not up to every individual provider to remember to do this, but it's just that the system supports them doing what the right thing to do is. And part of what's been able to help with that is leveraging electronic health records and, and having the e-referral capacity built into health records and having the entire care team engaged and involved in this rather than having it sit on just one category. You know, it doesn't just, the, the medical assistant may collect the information about smoking status, uh, a physician or other primary care provider may do a brief intervention. They may get support from a nurse that's working in a clinic and definitely from a pharmacist when they go to fulfill a, a subscription. But all these folks are working together rather than separately. And then that we measure the performance and recognize and record success just like we do for any other chronic condition. Uh, and, and that this uh, is, it, it's recognized as being important. Now, what I'm gonna do now is just set the stage for how what I've already talked about and a few more things I'm gonna talk about are examples of how people with tobacco dependency experience health inequities because of the nature of how we deal with tobacco dependence or don't deal with it. And um, let's start about the bottom line. Why is it reasonable to think about this? Well, okay, people are two to three times more likely to die at all ages from, from tobacco. Not a lot of 20 and 30 year olds die from their tobacco use, um, but not because not a lot of 20 and 30 year olds die from anything. But, but if they smoke, they're two to three times more likely to die from uh, died during that during their 20s and 30s than they would have otherwise. And this just blows up as the likelihood of people dying gets higher and higher as we age, unfortunately. Um, so that's a huge number, right? And your life expectancy if you're, you're a smoker is 10 to 12 years lower 
than if you were a non-smoker. And you course correct fairly quickly, especially if you quit in your 30s or 40s or even your early 50s. You get you, your your life expectancy comes back up again within a few within a few years. Um, so you would think, right? You would think that tobacco research and delivery was prioritized had been prioritized over the last 50 years, but it has not been. Uh, it got a lot better in the 90s than it was before when it was basically zero. But still, even five years ago, the, the entire NIH budget for tobacco research was about a third of a million dollars, a third of a billion dollars, excuse me. Now, a third of a billion dollars sounds like a lot of money, but the United States has, in 2020, spent $9 billion supporting vaccine development for COVID-19. Um, that, that third of a billion dollars represents less than 2% of the entire NIH budget. So we have not prioritized this for whatever sets of reasons as we have other things. So that's, that's why we have what we have today in terms of the type of interventions that we have. But it's not, it doesn't just stop there. It's that the adoption of these evidence-based treatments has been agonizingly slow. A lot of these things were shown to be effective back in the 80s and 90s. And we still are struggling to get healthcare systems to really mainstream these the way things like measuring high blood pressure, pressure, pressure and treating it uh, or diabetes treatments or COPD, even the, the things that are caused by smoking like COPD treatment have been mainstream. Um, now let's look at some other things that show how tobacco users are essentially suffering from health inequities compared to other uh, people with things that cause them harm. Users of addictive this addictive product are taxed, but the revenue from that tax does not apply to treatment or prevention. The vast, vast majority of that tax goes into other universes. And I'll talk a little more about this uh, in a minute. And now under the Affordable Care Act, tobacco users are now one of the only groups that an insurer can charge higher premiums for, up to 50% higher. And you know, there's some rationale for why this should happen, but where it leaves a tobacco user is that, un, you know, he, he, he may have to pay more because he, he smokes for health insurance. And then lastly, uh, we, have le we have left the environment of the tobacco user for many, many decades. We left it to be highly conducive to continuing their addiction and made it much harder for them to quit. Now, I'm just going to give one example about uh, the situation for tobacco users around what they have to do. They're spending, they're, they're, they're contributing about $25 billion a year to state revenue by paying state tobacco taxes, about $15 billion a year to federal, the federal budget by paying tax revenues. And to give you a sense of the scale of those numbers, the tobacco industry spends about $9 billion um, on marketing and promotion. In fact, if you add the revenue from the federal and the state government together to get about $40 billion, that is less money than the tobacco industry gets in profits globally from the sale of tobacco products. This is why at the beginning I said I was giving a disclaimer because I was a federal employee. You know, we're making as much money as the tobacco industry is. We writ large of all these different government entities. So, um, so anyway, it's worth thinking about. Because when you go further down, you go further down on these graphs here, you see that the CDC recommends that three uh, states should spend more than $3 billion on tobacco control programs. They, they spend less than half a billion, one sixth of that. Um, and it's perpetually at risk. And that's not just for treatment, that's for everything from you know, keeping 15 year olds from starting to policies, et cetera. Okay, now maybe one explanation for this would be, well, it's, it's different than other diseases because tobacco users don't, they don't want to quit, right? So why, we can't help them. It's, it's their fault because they don't want to help. Sorry, you're wrong. Look at this graph, um, which is uh, um, actually uh, uh, Jillian helped, uh, helped work on, on putting this, this information together. Of adults who quit, uh, 68, more than 68% of them want to quit. And this is also done from 2000 to 2015. You can say that's, that's stayed roughly equivalent over the last uh, 15 years. 
well, maybe they want to quit, but they're not really trying to quit. So why should we have to help them? Nope, sorry, actually, um, this has actually gone up a bit. So that last, last year, you know, we had over 55% or, or excuse me, in 2015, we had over 55% of smokers made an actual quit attempt where they quit for at least 24 hours or more. Um, well, so maybe they're all quitting, so what's the problem? Because they're, you know, most of them are quitting. Well, let's go to the third thing, and you'll notice, nope, they're not being successful. Um, uh, now, that, that, the good news is that's going up a little bit. The scale of this graph doesn't show it as much, but that is improving, and that's probably due to uh, improvements that we've made around getting people to use these effective treatments. But still, we're down in the five to 10, five below 10% range for uh, people who've recently uh, quit in, in the past year successfully, which doesn't jive with past year quit attempts at all, obviously. We've got about a um, little less than two thirds of people report that their healthcare provider uh, gave them advice to quit. I mean, that sounds pretty good. It's, it, it, but still, think about that. What if two thirds of people said that they, they, when they wanted to see their primary care doctor or their doctor, they'd, they'd gotten their blood pressure, but a third of them hadn't. Um, and this was a people that had high blood pressure, you know, and only a third, a third of them had not had it checked. We wouldn't stand for it. And then the, the numbers that use counseling medication are, you know, around 30%. Two thirds of people uh, who quit did not use counseling medication. A lot of room for improvement. So bottom line, if you're a smoker, you pay for other people's health care and roads through taxes and a tobacco settlement, but you may be denied coverage, awareness of coverage, or access to well-proven treatments that can quadruple your chance of success if used uh, in a maximal fashion. You may have to pay more just for your total health care solely because you're a smoker while your neighbor with diabetes, alcoholism, alcoholism or obesity does not. And you continue to be exposed to marketing and access to a deadly, highly addictive product in ways that uh, are not uh, consistent with how we, we approach deadly, highly addictive products uh, for most of the rest of society. And I just, I have at the bottom here, the, a, the World Health Organization's de definition of health inequities, which I'll pause to read. Health inequities are differences in health status, i.e., you die 10 years earlier than everybody else, or in the distribution of health resources, i.e. you don't get to have these medications given to you for your condition, whereas other people have medications that they do get uh, for them between different population groups arising from the social conditions in which people are born. And the reasons that people smoke or don't smoke are intimately wound up with their, everything from their zip code to their socioeconomic status, et cetera where they grow, they live, they work, and age. Health inequities are unfair and could be reduced by the right mix of government policies. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly show you this visually, a thing that I found a way to help think about this. Historically, the cost-benefit calculus was designed, and it was designed to do this, believe me, the tobacco industry worked very hard to make sure this happened, was that tobacco is easily accessible, smoking in public was legal, up until a decade or two ago, it's still legal in some states in our country. Advertising was unfettered. There was poor, access, poor to no access to cessation help and cigarettes were exquisitely and are exquisitely designed to addict. Okay, so what's been done to overcome those inequities? Mostly up until relatively recently, the, the solutions were jury rigged. We had originally, uh, you know, up until maybe 20 years ago, we had non-governmental organizations sponsoring group cessation classes to help quitters, and that was about it. Then, then we had health plans and providers who, in the 80s and 90s uh, who became interested in providing help, even though there was no way for them to get reimbursed for them. They just had to do it out of the goodness of their heart because they were like good doctors and nurses and pharmacists. How, how sustainable is that model? <laughs> <laughs> in the United States of America. And then we, we began to develop in the 90s, partly because there were, there were only these jury rig solutions, we began developing these state-sponsored quit, so, quit lines that were, were kind of outside of healthcare, they're, but they're sort of also a form of healthcare, you could think. Um, so we began developing these systematic approaches. Uh, and in healthcare, that was particularly this thing called the 5A model, which I'm not gonna go into in detail, 
but basically it was everything from the brief advice that clinicians gave to advising people to quit to giving them the assistance or a medication was then having follow-up. And this was integrated with quality improvement insurance and other community resources like quit lines. Then in 2010, 2011, 2012, we had a big breakthrough with the man mandating coverage under the Affordable Care Act and CMS that required health insurers to cover, cover these things. And there was enormous kickback and moaning and groaning. And there still is, and this has only been partially implemented and has always been con continuously under attack, but, but significant strides have been made. And then we've also had uh, the beginning of media campaigns that were actually linked to treatment rather than only encouraging people to make a quit attempt. And I will talk more about that. So the bottom line is expanding cessation in primary care and specialty care settings, uh, what's happened, the stuff that depends on healthcare access, like health system support, healthcare provider training, counseling, et cetera, you know, the glass is about half full with this, uh, or is it half empty? Yes, it's both. And for healthcare access where it's not, does not required, we've seen these things like quit lines and web and tech support that have actually become more, you know, deeper and more sophisticated so that they're almost like healthcare support, even though they're not fully financed by, by healthcare and then environment and policy change. So just the last graphic around this, I didn't wanna leave you with the person pushing it up, up the hill. So this is changing the cost benefit calculus. We, we wanna do it so that the person, it, tobacco addiction rolls downhill. And, and many of these things are starting to happen or, or are happening significantly, tobacco's been made more expensive uh, through taxation and less accessible uh, to some degree, but not a very impressive degree. We have smoke-free policies that have become significant over the last uh, uh, 20 years and counter marketing and promotion restrictions. And, and we have the capacity to make now cigarettes made less addictive. The FDA has had the authority for 10 years now that they could diminish the presence of nicotine and other additives like menthol that, that make uh, cigarettes harder to quit and more addictive. Um, and I mention all of these things because, you know, you'd think, well, like treatment, that just means what doctors do in the, in the um, exam room, right? But it doesn't have to because really how easy it is for a patient that I would see an advice to quit to actually follow through on that depends on what that patient faces when they walk out of the clinic and, you know, it, what happens in a convenience store, what happens when they watch TV and go on the internet, that all affects the probability that they can quit and stay quit. But the last thing that's really important is convenient access to help. We want help for smokers to be like the convenience store. Their experience when they come to a medical system, when they come to a pharmacy, should be like a convenience store for getting help quitting. Now, I'm gonna change gears a little bit and now I'm going to focus on what the, the sort of the classic um, thing that we think about when we talk about health disparities uh, in, in a population, that the, the reality, the populations, subpopulations face health equity treatment access disparities. And this is very, very, very important because uh, also even to keep in mind when delivering care to people is that, is that you know, if you're African American, you're going to have been subjected to um, decades and decades of uh, essentially racist policies, both outside tobacco, obviously around healthcare and many, many other factors about existence, but also even within tobacco, the the include. And I'm going to talk more about menthol, and and you will you'll get a little more of a flavor of how this pertains. Uh, but the other inequities that the groups have faced are often mirrored first in tobacco control, but then even within treatment and treatment access and their, their success or lack of success in trying to quit or succeeding in quitting. And I'm, I'm not gonna have time to go into all of these, but just quickly I'll mention the, there's actual geographic disparities that have grown remarkably worse over the last 30 or 40 years ago. 30, 40, 50 years ago, if you looked at a map of the United States and, and you saw the prevalence of smoking by state, it was almost the same everywhere. There was no huge geographic disparity. Uh, but now, as, as more and more tobacco control um, 
has been adopted in some states, but not other states, as, as the medical systems have become more sophisticated and inclusive in some st states, but not other states, other states that have not extended Medicaid, for instance, to the, to the population. We've seen these geographic disparities become larger and larger. So you've got in the South and the lower Midwest and Appalachian states that are, are more highly uninsured, that have fewer state services and don't have these policies. You're gonna have a, a smoking rate that's li literally two and a half times what it is in a state like California where it's hovering around uh, 10%. You've got states like Kentucky where it's at 25%. And then there's a larger disparity between urban centers and rural centers. Um, now, there's also a very important disparity around mental health sub and substance abuse and chronic diseases, where people who ha have mental, mental health and substance abuse disorders are much more likely to smoke, like twice as likely to smoke as the general population. And remarkably, people with chronic diseases, I'm gonna give you one example of this, uh, people that have a chronic disease that is smoking related or markedly improved by quitting smoking are more likely in general to smoke more, not less. Um, and part of this, there are many reasons for this. I'm just gonna mention that I think one of them is that there have been profound historic biases against providing tobacco treatment. For instance, in substance abuse treatment, where they use cigarettes as a reward, a reward for your good behavior on, in an inpatient ward that was treating alcoholism or, or other drug treatment. A lot of that has been improving, particularly in the last decade, but there's, there's a lot of baggage that's still attached within substance abuse and mental health treatment. Now, lower socioeconomic status, I'm gonna talk more about this, and I'm gonna talk more about race and ethnicity. I'm not gonna talk more about, about uh, differences between males and females. Uh, a lot less is probably known about that, um, but um, there, are, there are probably important differences even around receptivity to nicotine replacement therapy versus varenicline and bupropion that made difference between males and females. But, but again, it's just, it hasn't been very well studied. If there was something like this in, a, in another, condition, we would have figured it out in the last decade, but we haven't with tobacco yet. Um, so, socioeconomic status. Low SES smokers are less likely to receive cessation assistance from a healthcare provider. If you're, if you're um, poor or uh, a little, or not college educated, the doctor is less likely to talk to you about quitting smoking, even though you're more likely to be a smoker. And we know that cost and lack of coverage are a profound barrier to cessation treatment, especially for people uh, in low SES. Um, and it may be harder for them to access resources, to be able to get um, childcare, to be able to uh, have the freedom to be able to take part in some of the, the counseling activities or go to the doctor, et cetera. And plus culturally, there may be more of a, a distrust of the medical establishment and the environment that, that people live in, the, the, the density of retail stores that sell tobacco, the, the prevalence of, of uh, tobacco favorable advertising is higher in, in the um, zip codes, people of low SES. And briefly on race and ethnicity, I'm, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna focus my remarks on American Indians and African Americans, partly because they have the, the highest prevalence uh, uh, variance. Uh, compared to some other uh, race ethnicity groups. So American Indians um, had the lowest quit attempt rates of any racial or ethnic group. They had the lowest quit success rates and they had the highest uh, percentage of smoking and tobacco use at over, well over uh, 30%. There's variation from uh, tribe to tribe, but, but th this is the aggregate Number there are many many reasons that cause that have caused that have caused this to happen and many are predominantly related to the again the systematic uh, racism and subjugation that the American Indians in the United States have been subject to for hundreds and hundreds of years um, and some of them are specific to tobacco industry predatory practices uh, on reservations and towards American Indians and even product development like American Indian spirit and spirit uh, that specifically uh, steals 
the symbolism associated with being American Indian and, and repurposes it to sell tobacco products. For African Americans, uh, the, um, the good news for African Americans is that they have higher quit attempt rates than, than many other groups, including whites, but they have lower quit success rates. Um, and again, they tend to have lower utilization of healthcare associated treatment. Uh, but the good news is they have similar success rates when they do use treatment. So, and this is a very good, important thing to realize is that mo there, there don't appear to be a lot of substantive differences with how different human beings based on whether category they are, race, ethnicity, et cetera, are on how they respond to treatment with the possible exception that there may be some uh, male, female differences around literally biochemical differences that we don't know very much about. But in general, people respond well to the counseling interventions. They respond well to the medication use. The main issues are people not getting access to them. African Americans actually use quit lines at a higher rate, for instance, than, than other populations and do just as well with them. I'm now going to talk about menthol, which is um, a very, very, very important um, um, disparity, um, health inequity, uh, social justice issue, uh, especially for African Americans. Um, we know that menthol, the presence of menthol, we now know that menthol makes it easier to initiate smoking, it makes it harder to quit, and that we know there's been decades long promotion by the tobacco industry targeting African Americans specifically with menthol. And over the last decade, there have been many efforts that have been taken everything from the FDA down to states and municipalities to try to address the issue of flavorings associated with um, um, the, particularly the initi youth initiation that, that have banned all flavors, uh, almost all flavors except menthol. We're starting now in the last year or two to see uh, places where menthol is actually being included in this, which is very exciting. Uh, but you can see by looking at this graph that um, although there's certainly menthol is used by other, uh, other uh, racial and ethnic groups and it, it is an important factor in initiation with youth and young adults, still it, African Americans that uh, suffer the most from the continued uh, allowance of, of menthol in cigarettes. Now I'm gonna talk about an issue that's very, very important around, that, that illustrates both chronic conditions and, and probably also illustrates some things about how our society has thought about um, uh, the LGBTQ uh, community, because this is a, this is a slide about HIV um, and um, where there was clearly uh, dramatic uh, health uh, inequities, disparities, and social justice issues around how HIV was ignored for decades in our country. Now, however, what's happening around HIV and smoking? Well, it turns out that HIV is a major player, or excuse me, smoking is a major player in morbidity and mortality for people with HIV. This is a, from a study in Denmark that followed um, a cohort of uh, HIV positive people in Denmark for 15 years. And I know th these slides can be, it can be kind of tricky to, to, to track this. So uh, I'll try to just briefly talk you through it. Just look at the age of 65 and now look up from there. And you'll see that if you were, if you go all the way up to the top, the, 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 the solid black line is people that are, that are controls. They don't have HIV and they don't smoke. And about le less than 5% of those people at 65 died over that 15 year period. So again, 65 sounds old, but you're still not that likely to die getting from um, 50 to 65. But if you had HIV or were a smoker, you were an HIV or smoking, but not both, your likelihood of death was almost identical. It was about uh, one chance in, uh, about a 15% chance of death from one of those conditions. By this time, HIV had become a chronic disease. You know, back in the 80s and the, and the early 90s, it, it was a death sentence, but we'd figured out how to turn it into uh, functionally a chronic disease. A chronic disease with a higher rate of death, but still a chronic disease. But if you now go down at the age of 65, way, way, way down, to the 
a scrunchy line that says HIV and smoker alone, you will see that if you do both of these things together, your risk of death uh, is about 70%. Uh, you know, two -third, more than two thirds to three quarters of people died if they smoked in HIV. So you would think that we as a society would have done around smoking and, and HIV what we did for HIV alone, i.e., you know, complicated cocktails of, of medications that cost a lot of money that people are given a lot of instruction for, hospitalizations, et cetera. We have not. Uh, we, we've been trying to work to get pe the, the medical establishment to address smoking status in people with HIV more aggressively and systematically, but uh, there's still a lot, a lot, a lot of work to be done on that. Now, again, there's lots more I could talk about that. I apologize for not by being able to go into more detail, but I, I'm gonna jump now to solutions. Um, and I'm just gonna talk briefly about the first two. Uh, the, first, the first, and this is to the whole problem writ large, what, what, what could be done about um, uh, problems associated with tobacco's uh, second class status as a health condition, essentially. So a long time ago, uh, a governor in Massachusetts uh, gave, essentially created something like the Affordable Care Act. And it happened to have a number of things which, which were more strong even perhaps than the Affordable Care Act did. Um, it had a very, very generous smoking cessation benefit and they did a very strong promotion, made systematic access available. And they did all this over a very concentrated period of time. So it changed from one year to the next, which, which it's been much more slower with the Affordable Care Act. So we were able to study this better. And so they studied it and they found that 37% of Medicaid recipients in Massachusetts used this benefit. Now you may remember, I had said that the, the rate uh, you know, for using a benefit, benefit was far lower than that uh, in the general population, but they got 37% of people to use it. Um, and that's of Medicaid recipients. Among people at that time, they measured a drop in prevalence from 38% to 28%. In, in smoking during this time period after the state implemented it. And there was a, a concomitant 50% reduction in cardiovascular hospitalizations. Um, so they concluded that insurance-based coverage of smoking cessation treatments, as long as it was uh, combined with this aggressive promotion and access, ended up increasing quit attempts, use of treatments, and successful cessation. Um, now, another trial was done in a healthcare system at a VA where they did a randomized trial of 6,400 smokers uh, using the electronic medical record of, of, of the VA system. They randomized people to either get usual VA care or to get a proactive outreach program where they offered, they called the people on the telephone and, uh, and or gave them in-person cessation services via the mail and phone recruitment. So very aggressive attempt essentially to treat the VA population as a population instead of just people that came into the clinic. And what they found was that at one year, abs abstinence, not just the people who they saw, but of the total population of smokers was 13.5% in the people that got the um, proactive versus 10.9%. So an odds ratio of about a 25% increase. And, and again, the, this may not sound like much, but if you do these things at a population level, you get enormous, enormous, enormous benefits for public health. Um, excuse me. So now I'm gonna close by talking uh, in, in more detail about something that I happen to be intimately familiar with because I was in, have been involved in it over the past decade, both at CDC and since uh, coming back to the Pacific Northwest. And this is the TIPS campaign. Uh, and, but it's about a specific aspect of the TIPS campaign where we actually refer people for treatment. This was a large national media ad buy that's now gone for uh, almost or over a decade. Its goals were to raise awareness of negative health effects caused by smoking and exposure to secondhand smoke, to encourage smokers to quit and to let them know that free help was available predominantly by calling uh, a toll-free number that connected them with a quit line. Now the TIPS campaign, in terms of what we've talked about, about subpopulations targeting, it in addition to doing this broad swath for, that was aimed at all smokers, it was also doing targeted work to try to make sure 
that it was reaching and having an impact on important subpopulations. And this, this list uh, points out the, 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 um, the, target, the targeted population of interest. Um, it, does, it also uh, added in in the last couple of years, uh, specifically looking at dual users of e-cigarettes and mental illness and military and veterans. Now the ads were intentionally designed to show the diversity of US smokers. And an interesting, really heartening finding was that, um, because it, you know, I, I guess I would say white, whites were underrepresented relative to their, their, their numbers in the population, and that was intentional, and we did it unapologetically. But the, the wonderful news was that the race and ethnicity of ad participants did not seem to affect ad receptivity very much among respondents in any kind of negative way. In other words, um, uh, a 50 year old white man still responded in terms of being more likely to call a quit line or make a quit attempt, even if he was watching an ad that depicted a 50 year old African American or a 30 year, 30 year old woman. So, so this was, uh, we looked very, very carefully to make sure that this was, it was the case, but we also thought it was very important that these specific subpopulations saw themselves in the campaign that they didn't have to you know think like oh well, they're they're only showing us white people but maybe this applies to me or maybe it doesn't and these just show some of the the, the ad participants um and i'm now going to do a drill down specifically since i talked at some length about hiv um we did we were quite concerned by what we saw so so we uh in terms of the effect of smoking on hiv so we had we had some uh, HIV specific uh, ads that we ran uh, with uh, my colleague Brian, who uh, was uh, able to quit um, and did quit after having had an incident that was may have been smoking that where the two were synergistic as HIV and a smoking status. And here I show that the ads featured the calling the one in here quit now. So there's a there's a tag to it and this was also done uh, on other uh, essentially all the other ads now we also the other thing we did around um, subpopulation tailoring was we, we we made formats that aligned with the media consumption preferences of audiences so these two ads illustrate this first for this was this was for um, uh, and I apologize I'm not sure is this uh, which Asian language is in it? This is Korean. Uh, I'm not sure which, but but at any rate, it, they looked at the specific Asian population that they were they were focused on and found that this style that actually has more printed word in, in a printed thing than than we would normally do in a lot of our points, but but that this was preferred by doing focus groups and talking to to to, to representatives that they preferred this style of ad, which is uh, and so we used it and it has a special number at the bottom that hooked them with an Asian smokers helpline run by the California smokers helpline, uh, but, but run national, but delivered nationally uh, in four different Asian languages. And to the right, we see an ad that was aimed uh, at Spanish speakers that was, that used more than we'd done with other Asian, Asian we, we focused on the, the, the role of the expert in, in validating calling the quit line and, and it found that this was something through focus group work, et cetera, uh, what was more, um, uh, it, it resonated more with the, the Hispanic uh, Spanish speaking audience that we were, we were attempting to reach. And just to show, this is just a, a slide, we're getting near the end here, the tips of awareness among various demographics. Uh, you know, and you can see variance here but you know the lowest is 62.9% and the highest is 81%. So there was there was awareness among lower SDS. Um, the highest was among low SDS and African Americans, but there was really good awareness, uh, you know, across the board. But you'll see in the fourth uh, uh, set of graphs, which is around. Uh, education that the highest awareness was in people that were in, had less than high school and and the and the lowest was in people with a bachelor's degree and that's exactly what we wanted we want to make sure that our ad placement and the ad the 
the, the likelihood people would remember them was strongest with uh, the people that were most likely to uh, be smokers. And just a few final uh, things that we discovered was that African Americans and Hispanics were more likely to rate the TIPS ads as convincing, attention grabbing, and powerful, and that African Americans and Hispanics had greater emotional reactions and motivation, um, and that the race, as I said, the race and ethnicity uh, of the participants, however, was not a significant determinant of their reactions. So the bottom line was, it was, the most important thing was to have strong, compelling messages. That's what mattered the most. And we felt it was incredibly important to have a strong message, a positive message that people can quit, you can quit, you can do this, and that you can get free help either by calling the quit line or we also made uh, web and other mobile resources available. Just to show you that tagging these ads worked, this, uh, this slide shows over a, from 2012 to 2018, what happened um, during the course of the entire campaign, every single week. And um, what you see, the gray bars are sort of baseline. That's, what, that's how many people are calling quit lines in the United States every week. And the colored bars, with each year a different color, or sometimes phases, uh, shows what happened when the quit, the quit uh, line number was being, uh, when, the, when, the, when the campaign was uh, operational and they were being tagged. And as you can see, every year there was uh, a significant increase uh, in calls to the quit line. So we were connecting what we knew a campaign would make people more likely to make a quit attempt to also making sure that they were getting access to actual assistance to help. And this was definitive evidence that this was the case. Not only was it definitive by a time series, but we also did a study uh, where we looked at pre and post more, more closely in, in one year and, and found that, um, I, I'm just gonna focus on the fact that, that we computed based on what we saw in, our, in a sample of people, thousands of people across the country, that over a million and a half people made a quit attempt as a direct result of having watched this ad and that more than 200,000 people were still quit at the end of the campaign and uh, at least 100,000 quit permanently. Over the course of this campaign, a million people have quit permanently because of their exposure to this campaign. Now, I'm just going to do two other little things and then we will be done. The first is we also did a randomized trial that showed, I, I just want to show that even with media, it's not just about what doctors and, and uh, do or, or um, we do with medications. Even with media exposure, the same thing of dose holds. So we did, we did a trial where we randomized different markets to get a standard dose of, medi of, of media exposure to one where they got a higher dose. And what we found was that in the, the places that got a higher dose, um, they, they, there was more people at the population level made quit attempts, more were aware of the ads, and that the, this effect on quit attempts was markedly larger in African-Americans. It went from 32% of people uh, who were aware to over 50% being aware um, with in, in the African-American community. We also sound, found that those with a non-mental chronic condition were more aware. So these were, again, exciting validation that this very large uh, raising all boats was, was truly raising all boats and even raising boats that we were wanting to pay particular attention to, such as African-Americans, people with chronic conditions, that they were actually being raised at a higher rate, not a lower rate, which is what we, of course, worry about. Um, now, I'm just going to close with a final uh, example of a way in which we, we, we work to find this sweet spot, a spot, a place that would not only make quit attempts higher, would not only increase the use of evidence to support, but would actually increase the effectiveness of the evidence-based support. Because So what we did was we did a, a trial where we, we every, for a couple of weeks, several times during these campaigns, this is in the last, just in the last couple of years, we, we gave people something new, and I'll actually show this if I can do it. I'll show you, you'll notice at the very end, there's a little difference in how the ad is displayed. This is a TIPS ad. I've had a heart attack, COPD, a heart transplant, lung cancer, and part of my lung removed. My tip is, okay, this is smoking doesn't get you one way, it'll get you another. 
you can quit. Call 1-800-QUIT-NOW for help getting free medication. I've had a heart attack. Oh, here we go. Sorry. A heart transplant, lung cancer, and part of my lung removed. My tip is, if smoking doesn't get you one way, it'll get you another. You can quit. Call 1-800-QUIT-NOW for help getting free medication. Okay, so all we did was add for help getting free medication less than a second of time exposure to that one little variation. This slide shows in the, in the three years when this was done, it was only done a few weeks each time because the, the, the quit lines would freak out because of the volume increases and having to provide the NRT. So uh, we've only been able to do it for a few weeks here and there. But you can see looking at it that um, the yellow is when they, when they put that little tiny, tiny, tiny variation in, in the ad increased the um, uh, people's likely to, to call a quit line. And the great thing about this is it's two for one because they're more likely to call a quit line. And if they do, they're more likely to get medicine, which increases the probability that they'll succeed. So this is uh, essentially my uh, the final slide of going through stuff. We were at the sweet spot with this. And we saw, we saw increases uh, between the, um, the baseline, which was 147,000 calls that you expect to 80,000 with uh, calls if, if you add the tips campaign on top of that to almost another 40,000, if you just add, you just change one little tiny phrase in that 30 second ad, you, you get this. So this is, uh, this is the kind of stuff you can do, and, but you have to be thinking about that sweet spot in your interventions to do this. The same applies in clinical settings as well. Now I'm just gonna summarize first by talking a little bit about what you specifically can do. A lot of the stuff, obviously you can't run a tips campaign. Um, but you can do things that are very, very important. The first thing though, it's, is a little above the, the individual level. It's what can you do in your healthcare setting? Make sure that your healthcare setting is systematically identifying tobacco use status. And this should be done in any healthcare setting. Like it, it should happen in pharmacies. It should happen in primary care clinics and specialty clinics. It should happen, it, you name it, uh, something should be happening to make sure this happens and that there's barrier-free resources available for tobacco users who are interested in quitting. And that, these are, that there are resources available for populations of concern. If you're seeing a, a population that includes Asian immigrants that uh, for the first, their first language is Chinese or Korean, you wanna make sure that you, 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 can, you can refer them to the Asian Smoker Helpline, not depend on them to kind of figure that out. And you have to make sure that there's metrics on tobacco use treatment that are part of whatever your healthcare setting is doing uh, for quality improvement, quality assurance efforts. And then at the individual level, I think it's very, very important that we all strive to remain empathetic and committed to helping all tobacco users quit. It's a health equity issue. Uh, they, we, we don't have the resources we should have to help them. And that's not our fault and it's not their fault but we need to realize that's true and work harder because of that reality. And also realize that not addressing tobacco use or not doing it full tilt is you just wasted an, a clinical opportunity. One person quits, they add 10 years to their life expectancy. There ain't a lot of other things that you can do in clinical medicine for so little effort. And then finally, to stay aware of and battle against the continued disparities uh, that are impacting groups that are subjected to racism and other forms of discrimination. We have to stay aware of that and we have to keep active doing on that. So my final conclusions are simply effective treatments do exist now. Be nice if there were more of them, but they do exist. And that the treatment is multifaceted, medications, counseling, healthcare system change, and moving to make our environment more friendly for quitting. And that we know that the bottom line is that if you increase quit attempts in a population, and you increase the use of treatment support, you will increase the probability of quit success. We, we know that smokers and tobacco users suffer from health inequity, healthcare access, access disparities, and social justice concerns. The barriers to treatment use have decreased. We've made significant progress in the last decade or two, but they are still not commensurate with the size of the problem. We are not doing a hundredth or even a thousandth for a pandemic that's slow boiling and is going on for a hundred years. We're not doing the kind of stuff that we did for that, that we did for COVID for, for understandable reasons, but it, it's good to keep thinking about that. 
We know there are multiple subpopulations, including those with a high smoking burden that have worse access barriers and lower use of treatment. And we've got to do stuff about that. The good news, the very good news, is there are already solutions that exist. Hopefully more will exist in the near future. But the, the main problem now is that we can do something about is that these solutions have not been adequately applied. They have not been adopted. They've not been implemented. They've not been maintained. And we do have the power to do that. So thank you very much for your, your attention during all this. I'm just leaving you this on the screen uh, if you want to drill down into some of the resources that are available for help. And that's my contact information if you want to try to reach me. Thank so you thank so you much. much. Thank you, Jillian. Yeah, thank you, Dr. McAfee. It's really great to hear from a national and international expert on, on uh, tobacco control. I have one question I wanted to ask you that's a frequent one that we get from our students, and that's about tailoring. So you did a great job, I think, describing with a tips example of how both targeting and tailoring for specific communities can really be beneficial. Can you talk about what, if any, um, tailoring is warranted on the interventions that we have to help people quit? Is there any sort of tailoring that's needed to better reach specific communities or is it more an issue of, of reach in general? Well, that's an extremely important question. And I, I think the most important thing is to make sure that there are no barriers being put in place that would not allow these kind of standard treatments to, to reach somebody. And that can be every, it, and so really, obviously, if people are, afraid to come into a healthcare setting uh, because they're, you know, maybe they're afraid nobody there speaks their language, they're worried that they'll be demeaned because of low socioeconomic status or because they're obese or because they're uh, a certain color or uh, sexual orientation, anything like that is going to be a barrier for tobacco treatment. So, that, I mean, you know, that's just sort of the basics. Uh, and, and so, and then I think the other second one is that we, we need to, most of this can just be done by careful listening because what we really wanna do with anybody who smokes is wh what do you, what, what's the motivator for you? I don't care what should be the motivator for, like I think you should wanna quit for your health, but maybe the person wants to quit because they're worried because they're they're causing their child to be exposed to, to secondhand smoke, or you know, it's it's what's important to that person. And there is some variation from group to group. You know, there's maybe a little more emphasis in in Hispanic uh, communities around quitting for family reasons, for instance. But but a lot of that it doesn't really matter because those are distributions, uh, and you know, some of this is really you know core human things. Uh, that that it's so it's it's mostly just treating the person as an individual. The, the 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 there are a few things around, for instance, mental health and substance, or particularly mental health, where the benefit of using therapies longer mm -hmm. has been better established. So if somebody has, and, and we know that if somebody has a concurrent mental health condition, their likelihood of success is lower. Yeah. So working even harder with them to provide, you know, particularly dura a higher duration may be, may be helpful. Great, that's really helpful. Well, we um, so appreciate you taking the time with us today, Dr. McAfee, and thanks again to our sponsor for the module today, um, Northwest ATTC, we're grateful for their support. Um, so thanks everybody, and we look forward to hearing more discussion from all of you about this.